Wasabi guys, a lot has happened over the past couple days, and especially yesterday, the official launch day of the 30th anniversary edition. The one thing that could possibly unite the community against Wizards, I would say probably around 95% or more of the community despises this decision. And if you were to go on Twitter and look at just the responses that they received, every single one is just posting the card greed. You even get the Yu-Gi-Oh version as pot of greed. So an absolute fun time dunking on Wizards. My little musical number was well received, so I appreciate that. So now it's time to ask, how did we get here? What I'm about to play is a clip from a video I made about three years ago, and it was in anticipation for the then upcoming Throne of Eldraine set. There I discussed the new product announcement for the collector boosters that's pretty much persisted to this very day. Wizards does this with their expansions now. You'll get a draft booster, you'll get a normal set booster, you'll get a collector booster. So here we go, take a listen. And the idea here is that he's trying to serve different players, which usually never really works out well, especially with the whole collector's pack thing where he says it could be $20 to $25 a pack for one of these things, and you're supposed to be getting these exclusive cards, borderless featured planeswalkers. It sounds nice until you realize it's the same exact thing they did in the comic book industry, and it didn't really work out well then. Slapping the collector's label onto something doesn't magically just increase its intrinsic value. All you do is make it easier for people People to get these cards anyway. All they have to do is just pay $20 to $25 so they could still get the same cards, maybe not the borderless ones from the draft booster packs. The more of these masterpieces, collectors, items that there are, the less actual value you're putting into these products. Because that's the whole point of a collector's item is that not everybody has them. If you're printing these special shiny foil versions of cards and you've been doing this for every set now since Battle for Zendikar, nothing really feels unique about them. Therefore, the consumer's not going to feel that they're unique and you have a large portion of people that are probably going to ignore this anyway because they care more about the actual game rather than the collecting aspect of it the only cards that are actually really worth anything are on the reserve list because you're never going to get a reprint of them good intentions i think it's just terrible reasoning and i don't really expect this to appeal to anyone who's actually seriously collecting magic cards now i made a community post about this saying that this product specifically the collector booster is not the set some people got confused and thought I was talking about the set Throne of Eldraine. The collector booster for Throne of Eldraine, that was the Trojan horse that led up to the whole secret layer stuff with the Walking Dead crossovers, direct-to-consumer greed, and now we have the ultimate direct-to-consumer greed. Pay us this insane premium, $1,000, for 60 cards. And they're not even tournament legal. I know Wizards has tried doing this before, but they were way more subtle. The expeditions, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Don't shove it in people's faces. Stop trying to set the pace for the secondary market because you can't control us. We're the ones who determine the value of a card. It's just like anything else, it's worth what we say it's worth. And since it's not a necessity to play this game or collect these cards, you better believe we have even more of a say. What you need to understand about the collector boosters and everything else here, it's one massive veneer. And that's all it is, that's all you're paying for. And just think about it, when have you ever seen a product that was self-labeled collector's item ever hold any long-term collectible value? I mentioned in my video the comic book industry for a reason. Because in the 90s there was this obsession for the collectible market for comics. You had a lot of World War II comics that were worth bank. And people were more interested in the hobby as a whole. That started a new generation of comic book collectors. The problem with that, you have scarcity and then you have desirability. Just because something's scarce doesn't always mean it's valuable. You could make a turd statue. It's the only turd statue of its kind. It doesn't mean it's going to be worth a lot of money. And then you have the desirability factor. Is this actually what people want? No, because there's plenty of it. So the comic book industry is way more volatile because there's more of an emphasis on the collectability side of things. Magic, we have playability value. I guess you could say comics have reading value, but most people just read through omnibuses now, or they read digital. The point is, you can't just slap a collector's label onto something and magically make it a collector's item. In the 90s, every other comic was shiny and foil and one-of-a-kind, limited edition variant cover. You better get this before it runs out, boys. That was everywhere. And that was all under the delusion that the past was the present. That the old school comics that were highly collectible because there are only so many of them that are in good condition, that you can take that same collectible market and apply it to anything new when the print runs are just night and day different. I think what's going on now with Magic the Gathering is a microcosm of that attitude. People like cards like Gaius Cradle. People spend a lot of money on cards like Gaius Cradle. Wizards of the Coast wants to have its cake and eat it too. 
they know that there are a lot of big spenders in this hobby. It chaps their ass that they're not getting a cut of that on the secondary market. So what do they do? Well, if you're going to spend $1,000 on a guy's cradle, why don't you come on over here to our little direct-to-consumer experiment, drop a grand on this piece of crap product. That's the mentality. Remember a couple years ago when the reserve list shot up in price across the board for most of those cards? There's no way that that did not influence the current behavior of Wizards of the Coast. Again, we're the ones who determine the value of a single card. So if you're worried about what's going to happen after the out-of-stock or sold-out message for the 30th anniversary, oh my god, Wizards, they got exactly what they want, so they're just going to keep doing this, I wouldn't be so doom and gloom. I mean, it still sucks. But there is some good news. Because the collector boosters are so similar to what's going on here, I think it's fair to compare the products. When they first started releasing those, everyone lost their mind, like, oh, this is such great value, they're so fun to open, look at all these different shiny variant artworks and different borders and all that crap. And then you give it some time and they eventually all lose their value. Because you don't really value something just because you spent a lot of money on it. And I think that's what they think that we think. That, oh, you, hey, you spent a lot of money, you wasted all your money on this, this bullshit. Don't you find that to be valuable? All your, your thin pockets? You should be really proud of yourself, you dummy. And cards like Gaius Cradle, again, I'm going to use that as an example because that's a card that's bought and sold quite frequently, and it's pretty expensive. It has scarcity going for it. These products are not hard to find, and there is a lot of them. Wizards all year, the past couple years, they've been casting out this wide net, trying to catch all the suckers they possibly can. So when these sit on the shelves and they don't move, they get priced down. And you can look on TCG Player for pretty much every single one of these collector booster boxes. I think all of these have lost a significant amount of value. So what comes next is obviously everybody who got their 30th anniversary is going to try to resell them on eBay, and they're going to try to sell it for more than a grand. This is where it gets interesting because the community is so against this, and I don't know exactly the print run here. I don't know how many of these were sold. I can't imagine any of those folks who decided to turn around and try to scalp are going to have an easy time doing it. It's easier to do that with things like PlayStations where there's a lot of excitement around them. It's a new console, mommy and daddy. I gotta get it. A new console. These only come out like once every seven or eight years. And I don't want to be left out of my friends playing games and all that. With this, no one really needs it. There's no playable value here that you couldn't also achieve by simply proxying them. Like literally every single one of these, which leads us to another topic. C and D ing Card Conjurer, and just the attack on the freedom to create budget alternatives if you don't feel like wasting your life savings. That was yet another scummy decision on a long, long, long list of terrible mistakes for 2022. Don't you know you're cutting into their profits, Card Conjurer, with your free to use website? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Also, I've been enjoying watching a lot of content creators this week. I don't really do it that often for Magic. But I watched coverage from Jake and Joel, I watched Magic Historian, Alpha Investments, of course, Commander's Quarters. I watched Talarian every now and then because I think he ultimately comes around to the general consensus, even though he does associate with a lot of people who would probably not appreciate it. I think it was a very good moment overall. I think most of the community, we kind of understood what we needed to do, and it's to just continue applying pressure. Commander Void here signing off. I will see you all next time.